Hello and welcome to Pathways, where you are invited to join me for a visit with leaders in personal development and cultural evolution. This is your host, Paul O'Brien. Today we have a very special guest who's actually more than a leader in personal development. Uh, he's also going to be, or already is, my co-host on Pathways. So every other week on Pathways, you may be hearing the voice of our guest today, Donald Altman. And today we're gonna to be talking about fiction and specifically um, a new novel that Donald has written. And it's more than just a story. And, and sometimes novels are more than that. They can inspire spiritual renewal, hope, and lead to a deeper understanding of self. And today we're gonna to be discussing one such book, Donald Altman's new book, the forthcoming novel, Travelers. Now, Donald is an international mindfulness expert and an award-winning author of over 20 books, featured as an expert in the Mindfulness Movie and profiled in The Living Spiritual Teachers Project. He currently writes Psychology Today's Practical Mindfulness Blog. He is a psychotherapist and a former Buddhist monk whose work integrates ancient timeless practices into our modern lifestyles. Donald has taught thousands of professionals in healthcare, mental health, and business how to find resilience, wholeness, healing, and joy while reducing stress, depressions, and anxiety. And I'm proud to announce that he's joining me as one of our hosts on this Pathways show. Today, we'll talk about his new novel, Travelers, an inspiring journey about overcoming loss and grief through hope, healing, and spiritual renewal. Hello, Donald, and welcome to the Pathways show. Well, hello, Paul, and let me say I'm honored that you invited me to be a Pathways host, and I'm very much enjoying the process of doing that with you. Oh, I'm so happy. Yeah, it's so great. You know, I've been doing this now for 37 years, and I had a partner half that time, and then I did it myself for so long, and it's just so great to have a partner, especially one that's as gifted and qualified as you are, and uh, you're doing a great job, and so thank you very much. I really appreciate it. Well, thank you. And um, <laughs> also, I you know I met you on Pathways many, many years ago. From a That's, book right. That's right. You've oh, written wow. so many books. But writing fiction, this is a new thing for you. So what inspired Absolutely. you to write your first novel? Well, this was a story that uh, just something came to me about a story of healing, hope, renewal, recovery from grief. <clears throat> and I wanted to bring people into the idea was that struck me was with all the experience I have as a psychotherapist was to bring people into the world of a, um, a psych ward, of a psych hospital and what happens there and to look at maybe a different alternative way of healing because um, I think that psychotherapy has become in a lot of ways very mechanistic and there are a lot of therapists who don't do that, who kind of walk their, with their patients through the swamplands of their pain. And I think that's a path to healing and even could be a, a path to spiritual initiation, which is something we often don't think of. So I wanted to do that, to, to uh, tap that subject in a, uh, a fictional way, but, ha with, but have a basis of truth about it. You know, one of the conflicts in the book that's kind of built into the whole narrative is this conflict between old school, mechanistic, you know, just uh, medicate whatever the, the problem is, a very kind of, um, you know, mechanistic approach. And, and, and yet your character, uh, the uh, psychiatrist, is bothered by that. And he's really got a much more of an open-minded uh, spiritual dimension to his approach. How much did your personal history of working in a psychiatric hospital influence that character and, and this book in general? Well, I think it very much influenced that character and it influenced the kind of care that I tried to provide to patients. Uh, you know, I'm not working as a clinician right now. Most of my work is writing and, and also training. I do a lot of teaching and training for, for clinicians. But I, um, yeah, I was very much informed by what I tried to do with patients, which was not to pathologize them, right? and to see them as whole human beings and to help them look at alternatives because I think we are very focused on healing people as fast as we can. And if we can you know, give them a, a simple way to do that, 
there's a tendency to move in that direction. And I'm, I'm definitely not saying in the book that we should never, should not use um, uh, different medications. I'm not a prescriber anyway, by the way. I think they have a place, but what I do think is that we need to open up and look at the alternatives and look at our whole being. Um, and that, that can lead us in, in, in some very unusual directions that might actually stay with us for a lifetime. Right. So first you start with shock treatments and then you see if you can use uh, uh, mindfulness training. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> um, there is a, an episode in the book that involves him possibly getting shock treatments. But anyway, I don't want to be too much of a spoiler in this interview because it was a great book. It had a lot of suspense and I, I don't want to ruin that. But OK, they, I've heard it said that fiction is always autobiographical. And so it makes me wonder how um, much was the young man, the patient in the book uh, named Mason, um, how much was he based on uh, any parts of your uh, personality or upbringing? Well, uh, you know, I think Mason was a composite, but certainly drew upon some of my experience growing up. Um, Mason's family plays an important role in the book, and you see the family dynamics, which are kind of broken there. And I, I you know, I experienced a, uh, an abusive uh, family pattern growing up. I see. Uh, and I, like the character, had a uh, depressive episode, I'd say in my early 20s. And <clears throat> I didn't realize it at the time, but it was actually, for me anyway, uh, I can look back and say, well, that was a spiritual initiation for me. That was a time when I started experiencing different things like out-of-body experiences uh -huh, and uh -huh. different kinds of awarenesses that opened up. And maybe it opened up because I was under such duress. And it gave me a view of something that, you know, maybe something otherworldly, but it gave me a sense of hope in that even as mired as I was in the depression that I was experiencing and maybe didn't see a way out. Um, I also got a glimpse into something that said, hey, this isn't all there is, right? There's another uh, way of seeing things, another truth perhaps. And it, and it gave me actually at the time a sense of relief. Uh, but in the book, it's very threatening to this psychotherapist or to the psychiatrist who's very rational actually and he's experiencing grief. I could give a little synopsis of the book. It's about a psychiatrist who has lost his daughter um, at a at a you know a very at a young age, and it's it's really tearing his life apart. It's tearing his relationship with his wife apart. And so it looks you know the book kind of looks at how a loss like that can really transform your life in. A difficult way, and he's he's fighting with that, and he's not able to heal himself. And here's writer, somebody who knows how to help and heal others, but he can't heal himself. And then around that time comes in his life uh, this suicidal young man who is really uh, struggling and is in in and is part of a very dysfunctional family system. And he also meets at the same time um, uh, what I call a mystical traveling pet therapist who has a sentient canine and, and um, she is actually gonna guide, guides him on a, uh, she becomes work, she works at the psych clinic, but she guides him on um, a, a spiritual journey of initiation. She guides, the, she guides the psychiatrist. Psychiatrist into that. He's very resistant, but he starts to see that he needs to do this. If he's gonna heal or he's gonna help save this young man, from, uh, and I don't want to give anything away, but from the confines of this uh, mechanical oriented system. And which by the way, um, I was kind of inspired by uh, One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest. Right. And fabulous book. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. And so from a clinical point of view, the young man's diagnosis was that he um, was uh, majorly depressed, but they well, were trying, the, his father, was sort of out, was highly embarrassed by him and, and um, wanted to have him put away. And, um, and he was kind yeah. of the motivating force behind the possibility of doing some draconian um, things right. like in one flew and, over and the 
question in the book as to whether or not he is uh, experiencing schizophrenia. So that um, plays into it. I thought it was brilliant the way that the psychiatrist has his own set of problems. And he's very real about that, this grief that you mentioned and uh, his marital discord. And um, it was a very, very touching. And he's trying to help this young man who has a different set of problems. But then this young man, um, uh, presents this kind of supernormal um, ability that uh, is kind of summed up in the word traveler. And so what, what you know, when I, I, I thought about travelers in the book and I thought, wow, is this uh, about astral travel or is this about aliens? It kind of reminded me of, of an alien movie that I've seen before. And uh, so, but how, and, and this woman who, is working in the garden and, you know, and has this, you know, really amazing dog. She's a traveler, you know, and, and maybe the psychiatrist turns out to figure out that he's a traveler too. I, so what is a traveler? Well, I, you know, I think of a traveler as the, the, the mystery, the wonder, the, that uh, kind of unknown space that we can reach. It's the possibility that's alive in each of us right, the untapped possibility of the miraculous happening. And so uh, there, there, you know, there's some ideas in the book. We talk about consciousness and quantum consciousness and, and um, Jungian ideas, for example. Uh, so there's a lot of exploration of what a traveler might be. Might it be an angel? I mean, he is he starting to try to find, wend his way through this journey? And of course, with this woman who's guiding him and he can't understand how she does some of the amazing things she's able to do, it just blows his mind. Um, but so as he's drawn in, he's, you know, he tries to keep an open mind and he doesn't know exactly how or what she does. And at the end of the book, he comes to a conclusion uh, of, what a traveler is, what it means to him. Right. And I think you say, though, it could, I hope for the reader that they can see it in the way, really the way that you described it here is what really is this <laughs> traveler? Right. And so the, the book to me is another kind of journey for the reader. And it was a journey for me as I wrote it. In fact, uh, you know, it occurred to me today, one amazing thing happened when I, after I was done with the book and I, and there's a kind of a, uh, an experience that the psychiatrist has. He's taken on a, a journey in the middle of the night to this wilderness place. Right. I knew this place, but I, uh, in the book I described an area I hadn't been to, I just wrote it and, you know, I was, um, it was fiction and, you know, it's the writer's prerogative to add and I just wrote some stuff. But he, in the story, he actually has a, an injury and he's a very serious injury. So I'm hiking in this place and I fell at the same place where my character fell and I experienced the same injuries, <laughs> like in the same places. Fortunately, I didn't. Um, this is over. this is before you wrote the book, right? This is after I wrote the book. Oh, wow. <laughs> I had an injury and I fell. And as I was limping out and I was assisted by my wife who was there with me <laughs> and I started to notice things it's like, oh, my God, I wrote these these description of these things i had never been to this part of this wilderness area before hey donald you're a traveler man <laughs> <laughs> so that was silver falls state park here in oregon right, right. Which and is i like the way ten thousand foot square foot wilderness area yeah right right yeah i love the way that you this book is is positioned right around here in the Portland area or in, in Northern Oregon. Um, that was kind of cool for somebody who's lived here for a long time. You know, in, in that, um, he has what looked to me to be an ayahuasca experience or something. It was a great description of an ayahuasca experience. And I've done ayahuasca, so I, I saw it that way. But um, I'm from, you know, I'm an old coot and I've done psychedelics in my youth. And uh, but was that was that was based on um, the ayahuasca type experience where they uh, definitely it was based on the ayahuasca type of experience that he went through. Wow, that was a great description. That was yeah. really good. And um, <clears throat> I really liked uh, the way that you portrayed 
alternate states in the book. Um, and you, in the book or the care through the novel, through the story, it's obvious that um, you, the author, are probably critical of traditional treatments for depression, schizophrenia, and other forms of mental illness. Were, but were you at all trying to advocate for any particular type of therapy for Mason's condition? Well, you know, I... Um, I, I mean, directly I, or indirectly? Yeah, in the book, um, uh, Mason is treated with some cognitive behavioral therapy ideas, maybe dialectical behavioral therapy ideas, internal family systems ideas. And, you know, I, as a therapist, I was always kind of what you call eclectic. I kind of brought things together in different ways. I didn't use a very, um, you know, a manualized, okay, follow step one, two, three, four. And I, I kind of, to me, I wanted therapy to be a very creative process. And I didn't know it was going to happen moment by moment. So, um, and, and and I hope that comes through. So I think when when somebody is experiencing any kind of mental health issue, that you do get help, that you do seek help. And in Mason's case, he got the help that he needed. Um, and he, you know, his his mother came to his aid and helped him. So uh, it's important that we seek help, and and. That you, you know, you, you're going to want to trust whoever is working with you, but that doesn't mean that you have to be limited to that. You know, I've had clients, for example, Paul, who um, were um, had suicidal histories in their family, or their grandparents and their mother maybe suicided or had uh, or institutionalized, and then this person said, you know, I've been on um, antidepressants since a very young age, and it's part of my family. It's who I am. Uh, but when working with them, they started to see that they had more uh, locus of control. They had they could take more control over. Yeah, I have these issues, but I can learn tools that can help me cope with them. Right. So they, you know, so they broadened out their idea, their narrative of the story. It didn't mean that maybe they still didn't need additional help. And so if the help comes in a, you know, I when I had my own depressive disorder many years ago. The medications I took were very helpful to me, and they helped me feel normal again for a period of time. Right, and that was important in my recovery. So there's no way that I would say, you know, uh, exclude that. But I think my approach uh, in the book is that let's let's look at all the options that are available to us. Yeah, no, I really like that, and I was very impressed that uh, IFS or Internal Family Systems was featured in the book, because I don't think most psychiatrists know anything about uh, IFS therapy. And we've actually done some shows, I've done some shows here on Pathways about IFS um, with IFS therapists and teachers. And I've actually, I use IFS therapy in my own life and I think it's fantastic. And I was very happy and surprised to see that uh, as part of this psychiatrist uh, repertoire mm. in the book. Yeah, he, he brings it in and, and tries to help the family use it as a as a means for uh dealing with some of the family trauma and right really help that right yeah. right yeah and um the main character the psychiatrist in the book he learns from mason's healing journey did you have you had similar experiences as a psychotherapist oh i i, I learned from my clients all the time i mean um and and you know it was a two-way street we i think we learned from each other and that was the beauty of it. I, I, and I, and I stressed even in this, in Travelers, I'm trying to stress the idea that, um, you know, if therapy is hierarchical, where it's all coming from the top down, and I'm telling you, this is what you need to do to get better. How is that going to really help somebody? Because they don't feel it's coming from them at all. Right. 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 If it doesn't right. work, who they can blame. Well, you told me to do this, right? So how do you get somebody to be collaborative in the work you do with them? And I think, you know, that's really important in any therapeutic um, relationship. Right. Um, it, so in general, what would you say we can do to open ourselves to unknown possibilities and broaden our perception to include miracles and such? Yeah. Well, one thing I would say is, you know, a lot of this 
book, one of the one of the themes anyway, is about overcoming grief. Yeah. And so uh, a lot of times we have we might have a tendency to push grief away. It's painful. I don't want it. Right. I want to get over it. But sometimes, you know, grief may stay with us a lifetime. And I think there's a lot that we can learn from grief and a lot of healing that can come from grief. A lot of, uh, you know, you talk about miracles. I think a lot of miracles can grow from grief. Grief is like a seed that, uh, you know, it's planted, but it can produce some beautiful uh, flowers. And so it can make us aware of what we do have and the preciousness of everything that we do have in our life right now. So. Um, is there yeah, a proven that, is, is there a proven way to overcome grief? Oh, I think there are so many ways. There's no one proven way. I think as many there are probably as supposed to be eight billion people in the world. I think there's eight billion ways to overcome grief. <laughs> <laughs> and how and, long does it take to recover from grief? <laughs> like I say, I don't think there's any prescribed amount of time. You know, it's interesting. I talk about in the book about the DSM, which is it's a diagnostic and statistical manual. And this right. character book is forced to use codes to describe what problem a person has. And but that's because insurance company will pay out according to those codes. Okay? Right, right. Now the DSM actually now has a thing where if grief lasts longer than a year, it's a pathology, and then they'll pay for treatment. But I mean, who says that grief shouldn't last more than a year? Oh, for right? sure. Yeah, I mean, it, and often it does, and uh, you know, and, and 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 that might provide an opportunity for us to grow as a result too. Not to view it as, oh, what's wrong with me? I can't get over this. You right. Know, you talked about opening up, and I think, um, you know, as a, as, a, as a mindfulness teacher, one of the things that that I uh, that mindfulness does it helps us uh, open up and get more into this moment in an open and ex accepting way. So mindful is very much about acceptance. How can we accept what is happening around us right now? Often we're either, either trying to grab on, we like an experience, we want more of it, we grab onto it, or we're trying to avoid it and we're pushing it away. We don't like it. Right. And, and openness can get us beyond that because those states of pushing away or grabbing produce suffering really one way or another right uh, so right. uh learning how to let go forgive how to be open how to open your heart how to bring love are really wonderful ways to um to release uh, pain of, of, of many kinds so getting back to the book what was the biggest challenge for you in writing this book you know i, th I think the biggest challenge was allowing the characters to have a life of their own and not for me to impose things on them. You know, I have a spiritual, um, uh, a spirit animal in the book, a spirit guide that this psychiatrist finds. And initially, you know, I wanted to impose my own personal and I've, I've done some spiritual journeying and I have a spiritual animal. And I tried to impose that on the story and the character and it just, it didn't want to go in that direction. Wow. <laughs> So I had to step back and and um, I, kind of, I think it was kind of from a dream that I had. I woke up and I was like, all of a sudden, I knew what the spirit animal was. It's actually it's on the cover of the book, uh -huh. uh, and it surprised me because I thought, well, how's this going to work? <laughs> and oh, oh, you... yeah, there it is. So now you I don't know, know if that. anybody can see what that animal is. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I could see it. <laughs> Well, okay, we're running out of time here. And I just want to ask, what are you hoping readers take away from, from Travelers, the book? Well, I, I hope that they uh, realize that we, you know, we're, we're all uh, here uh, as travelers in one way or another. It's kind of a mystery. We don't know why we're here or how we got here, but at least we can help other travelers along the way. Like we can help one another and we can start to view others as travelers and um, try to ease their way. It's like you're out and you know, you're driving around, you, you run out of gas, you're hoping somebody comes along and, and helps you out there. So we're all right. travelers. Really. Okay, that's a beautiful lesson. Okay, so the book isn't available yet, and but when is it gonna be published? Well, it, it's actually, uh, it is available for pre-order 
right now. And that's through my website, mindfulpractices.com. You can see different places you could get it, whether it's, you know, Amazon, an independent bookseller, or whoever. It's going to be released on February 1st of 2023. So that's I see. the actual release date. And so... And what, I have a chapter up online, too, if somebody wanted to read the first chapter of the book. Okay, so if they wanted to pre-order the book, they could go to your website, mindfulpractices.com, where they could also read a chapter of the book. Mm -hmm. And what is the advantage of pre-ordering? Well, actually, you get a, you get a, um, a little discount off the price okay. of the book. And yeah. it's advantageous for you, the author, too, right? What's that? And it's supportive of you, the author. Well, yeah, definitely. I, you know, I'm very, uh, I have a lot of gratitude for all the people that read my work and, uh, um, and I feel connected. No, but I don't mean just monetarily. I mean, in terms of like, you know, your ratings or your, you know, bestseller at status or that kind of thing. Oh yeah. 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 No, it really helps. Uh, I think get the book out there. And I, I, you know, the book is a healing book and I think it's a, it's a hopeful oh. book about finding hope and, and yet, yet I think it's a dramatic uh, kind of book for people. Who Donald, enjoy reading. I, I enjoyed it so much. I think it's going to make a great movie too. It's got a lot of suspense. Oh. It's got a lot of colorful elements and it's very well written. You're an incredible writer. I mean, I already knew you were a great writer, but fiction, fiction's a different kettle of fish. And I was quite happily surprised and very um, happy to have you as a guest on our show uh, for that reason. But, uh, well, at this point, we have run out of time. And I, I want to remind our listeners about your website, which is mindfulpractices.com. And then they can find out all kinds of things there, including how to pre-order Travelers, a book I highly recommend. Um, it's, it's, uh, it's a good read. It's really engaging. Um, and okay. I want to say for those who may have tuned in to Pathways Late, this is your host, Paul O'Brien, author of Intuitive Intelligence, a book that shares the theme of Pathways, which is personal and cultural evolution. And I've only written three books, but <laughs> and this one is the, it's the main one. Um, but it, I want you to, even if you were late today as a listener, don't worry, you can play or share this interview whenever you want via the internet or as a free podcast. And I'll tell you how in a minute. Today, we've been visiting with Donald Altman, author of the new book, Travelers. And I want to say thank you to all of our listeners for tuning into Pathways, which is broadcast and streamed on the internet at www.kboo.fm, produced every Sunday morning by Donald Altman, our guest today, or myself, at 8.30 USA Pacific Time. And even better, podcasts of today's show, which you can listen to and forward to others, are available for free at divination.com. That's spelled D-I-V-I nation.com as well as via iTunes, my YouTube channel, and other free podcast servers. This is Paul O'Brien reminding you to tell your friends about Pathways Radio and Podcasts. And thanks again to Donald Altman and to all of you listeners for tuning in and being a part of the Pathways Conversation.